BBC Two, now Zigzag takes a look at life under Norman rule. We've seen how the Normans came to England, and we've seen where they chose to live, in castles. But what about the people they now ruled over, the Saxons? Where did an ordinary Saxon peasant live? Well, it would be in something like this, a simple hut. The walls were made of wood and mud. The mud acted like plaster and filled in the gaps between the beams and the roof was thatched with reed and straw. The base of the roof was made up of thin branches woven in and out of the beams. And on top of the branches, they laid a thick covering of thatching. How many windows can you see? None. Glass was very expensive in those days, so ordinary people mostly didn't bother to have windows. It was very dark inside, so they relied on the light coming in through the door. And they would have simple lamps like this to help them see into the dark corners. Well, this is all it is. A single room where the whole family would eat and sleep. And over here is the hearth for the fire. Oh, that's good. In order to stop the Saxons from causing trouble, William passed a law that all Saxons had to be indoors by eight o'clock. And they also had to put out their fires by then. That was known as the curfew, covering up the fire. Do the huts have chimneys? No. The smoke just has to find its way out through the thatched roof and all the cracks in the walls. The people who lived in huts like these were mostly small farmers. Usually the land they worked on belonged to someone else and it was divided up into strips. Like all farmers, their lives had a regular pattern and you can get quite a good idea of what they did from the Bayer Tapestry. These peasants are shown ploughing and sowing. Another way we can learn about their lives is by looking at the calendar books that were written at the time. These showed the different months of the year, and there was a different illustration for each month. See if you can guess what the people in the pictures are doing. work out. 
Let's look at it again. Here's May. It's spring and the flowers are out. In June, it's time to cut the hay in the meadow. He's using a long farming tool called a scythe. July is harvest time. This man is cutting the corn with a sickle. Next, they have to thresh the corn to separate the bits you can eat from the bits that are no good. In September, they tread the juice out of the grapes to make wine. And in October, they sow the seeds in the fields that will be ready for harvesting the following year. Now, what do you think this man's doing? Well, at this time of year, you get acorns on oak trees and he's knocking the acorns down for his pigs to feed on. By December, the acorns have all gone. There's nothing to feed the pigs on anymore, so most of them are killed to help feed the family through the winter. Here's January, the two-faced month that looks backwards into the old year and forwards into the new year. Ah, oh, and here's my favorite picture. All you can do in February is to try to keep warm and dry your boots out over the fire. And above the man is what's left of his pig. It might last till spring if he's careful. Meat in those days was a luxury. Mostly they ate dark rye bread like this. Hmm, not bad I suppose. With some parsnips, Onions, beans, and swedes. Vegetables that they'd grown in their own small gardens. They had no sugar, so they kept beehives and used honey instead. And when times were hard, they went into the woods to collect nuts and berries and made soups from things like nettles. How would you like some nettles for your lunch? Not much, I expect. Doesn't sound like a very nice diet, does it? And worse still, there usually wasn't much of it. That's bad, because when people don't get enough food, they're much more likely to catch diseases. And that meant that many people in those days died young. If your class had been born a thousand years ago, less than half of you would still be alive by the time you were nine. The sad thing was, there was lots of food in the forest. Wild boar, pheasants and deer. Just what the Saxons could have done with. But ordinary people weren't allowed to go hunting. That was reserved for William and his friends. If they came across deer or wild boar, they hunted them with the hounds. And if they came across pheasants and game birds, they hunted them with... Well, what do you think they used? They used falcons. A falcon does two things very, very well. It's expert at flying, and it's expert at killing other birds. This is what it kills with razor-sharp talons. And this is what a falcon looks like in full flight. We'll slow it down so that you can see better. The falcon doesn't hunt for fun, it hunts for food. Food for itself and food for its hungry chicks.
As you can see, falcons are wild birds, and they can never be tamed like pets. But for thousands of years, men have been training falcons to help them catch birds. This man is setting off onto the moors with his falcon and dogs, just like William and Harold on the Bayer Tapestry. The job of the dogs is to find the game birds and drive them out into the open. While the man is still on the move, the falcon's head is kept hooded. This will keep the bird sitting quietly on his glove. But once they reach a good spot, the owner takes the hood off and releases the falcon. Soon afterwards, the dogs drive out a couple of grouse birds. Once again, we'll slow it down so that you can see what happens. There are the two grouse. And here comes the falcon. Missed. Well, nobody's perfect. But next time, the falcon does rather better. A sudden cloud of feathers, and it's all over. The falcon has made its kill and sits on the dead bird till the owner arrives. To the Saxons, the Normans must have seemed like falcons, wild birds tearing at the body of England. But how did the Normans see it? Well, I think I know who to ask, and I think I hear him coming. I thought you might be back. Odo, I've been thinking about the Saxons. They had a bad time, didn't they? What do you expect? They lost. But these forestry laws, surely there's no harm in catching a few animals for the cooking pot. Well, you and I might think so. But then were not William. He loved hunting. He hated to be disobeyed, as simple as that. What happened if someone was caught poaching? Nasty. He put their eyes out or cut their hands off. Very nasty. He was a hard man, your brother. Oh, yes, he was hard all right. But I'll say this for him. The laws were the laws under William. They used to say you could carry a purse of gold the length of the country and no one would dare rob you. If you broke the law, you were punished. Who decided if you had broken the law? How did they tell if you were guilty or not? Well, there were the old-fashioned ways and there were the modern methods. One of the old-fashioned ways was trial by ordeal. The person who was being tried was made to hold a piece of red-hot metal. That burnt the hand, of course, and it would be bandaged up. A week later, the judges would look at the person's hand to see if the burn had healed. They believed that if the man was innocent, God would heal his hand. But if the burn had not healed, the man was said to be guilty and punished. But it didn't always happen like that. In some cases, William persuaded people to use juries. When a case was being judged, 12 ordinary people would be brought to the court and it would be up to them to say who was right and who was wrong. A good system. And one we still use today. He was a clever man, William. Was he the sort who writes books? Writes books? Why, he couldn't even write his own name. Do you want to see what his signature looked like? <laughs> Is that all? When he was signing his orders, he just used to put a mark against his name. But he respected those of us who could write. In a way, he helped to write one book himself, the Doomsday Book. Have you heard of the Doomsday Book? Yes. The children said they were going to do one of their own. What was it exactly? Well, he wanted a record of every town and village in England. Who the land belonged to before Hastings, who owned it now, how many ploughs there were in each village, and who the mills belonged to the lot. And the only way to make a record of all that information 
was to write it down with one of these. So he sent his clerks off round the country, and for two years they asked questions, questions, questions. And the answers they came up with were written down in one huge book, the Doomsday Book. Well, we haven't any film of William's clerks at work, but I can show you how the school set about making their Doomsday Book. On behalf of the king, come up one at a time when you're told. That table first. Nine. Gemma. Age. Six. Have you a bicycle? Yes. Have you many ball points? No. Have you a watch? Yes. Next. Name. Louis. Age. Six. Have you a bicycle? Yes. The king wishes to know how much his barons own. I will ask you some questions. Do you own a motor car? No, I own a bicycle. Do you live in a house or flat? Flat. How many peasants in your class? 31. Were you here before the invasion? Yes, I was. That is all. You may go. Kim wishes to know how much his barons own. Do you own a motor car? Yes, I own a motor car. Do you live in a house or flat? I live in a house. How many peasants in the class? I have 31 peasants in the class. Were you here before the invasion? No. That is all. You may go. Thank you. Name. Flora. Age. Seven. How many fell tips? Thirty. Do you have a bicycle? Yes. How many ball points? None. Have you a watch? Yes. How wide is the classroom? Six metres. How wide is the table? One metre long. Fifty centimetres wide. That is all. God save King William! God save the King! That's something else you could be doing. When you finished your tapestry in your castle, you could do a survey of your school and put the results in your own doomsday book. That's what they've done at Queen's Manor School, and a very thorough job they've made of it. Maybe you'd like to do the same. Was William pleased when his doomsday book was finished? He would have been, but he would have died before it could be completed. How did it happen? But he just captured a town in France, and he was riding through the burning streets when his horse reared and threw him. And that was it? Yes, he never recovered. He lived for another three weeks, but there was nothing the doctors could do to save him. And that was the end of the greatest man in Europe. Was William a good king? <laughs> That's something you'll have to decide for yourself. But I'll say this for him. He made his mark all right. England will never be the same again. And now I must be going. For the last time, you may kiss my ring. Goodbye, English girl. Remember, Bishop Odo, 
and remember his tapestry. Goodbye, Bishop Odo. Goodbye. He faced the Saxon army that Hastings. He faced the Saxon army and won. He cast the Saxons down and seized the English crown. William, Duke William, the Norman. 1066, 1066, 1066 at Hastings.